let's get started, man. I'm super excited for this. Uh, so for those of you guys that are joining, we got a, over 200 of you here. Uh, what we're going to be talking about is sales psychology. And the, the title of this webinar, I don't think really does it justice. I texted uh, Bilal in all honesty. He sent something way better back and I forgot to change it before it got sent out. <laughs> But we're going to talk about sales psychology in a really no BS, very practical way that's going to, uh, one, either help from an outbound standpoint and get you more meetings, or two, help from a sales standpoint. And we want today to be as interactive as possible, and we want to help give you some real examples. And we're going to share some examples from our personal experience and also stuff that we've helped clients with. And if you haven't heard of Bilal, he is... I mean, I couldn't think of really a better person, uh, Bilal, to talk to about this because you kind of marry the theory together with like making it really practical. But um, he's the leader of, I don't know, do we call it a movement? Death to fluff? What do you call it? Yeah, let's call it a movement. That's just nice and vague. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> nice path. death to fluff movement. Um, and, and really, it's all about how do we eradicate bad sales advice, right? He's also the seven time, a seven time founding sales team member. So he's been on a uh, seven different startups on the founding sales team. So he's had to create a lot of this stuff, but dude, without further ado, man, let's, let's get to this. I'm, I'm excited to jam with you on another webinar, man. I appreciate it. I, uh, I thank all of you guys for taking the time to join us today on this webinar. Really excited to do this one. And yeah, as Jason said, I, I, I think I've been on enough webinars where they talked about the theory of the thing. Like I, I get fear of loss is twice as powerful as the pleasure of gain. I've heard it a million times. I've seen a million LinkedIn posts about it. How do I do that in a cold email? Right? Like, how do yeah. I do that on a disco call? Like, show me the actual way, show me the standard. And I think that's what Jason and I want to try to accomplish today. So you guys can keep us honest on that, that we actually want to show you the tactical way where you insert and inject this psychology that is proven to work, right? Everything we're going to talk about today, there are Cochrane studies longitudinal studies proving that these things work, whether it's neuroeconomics, general economy, social psychology, it's been proven to work. We just don't use it as sellers. We just, because we don't get trained on how to sell, we get trained on our product. And it's a yep. very weird thing. And this is just like an engineer going back to coding school to learn a new coding language. You guys need to learn this language of psychology and apply it to your sales process and your sales motion. So, that being said, there's a question that we wanted to ask. I don't know if you already popped it in, Jason, about who's I'll pop it into predominantly the inbound or outbound. Okay. Yeah. So definitely want to know whether you're more inbound focus or outbound focus. That's step, that's you, step one. Yeah. yeah. Start with that. I th accidentally threw both questions. Yeah. Let us know. Are you doing mostly inbound or outbound? A lot of it. We're seeing predominantly outbound, like you said, Jason. You I called it. it. He's my okay, outbound great. warriors, man. Yeah, outbound warriors. <laughs> love it. Okay. And then as you're writing those in, the second question is, and take a moment to think about this one, because this will also help me kind of adjust how we talk about this. Is your product considered by your buyer rip and replace of something they already have or net new? That one's a little bit mixed. Looks like seeing some net news from both. Yep. Yeah, that, that one I figured would be a bit mixed. Okay, so I'm going to try to more heavily focus on outbound today. Sorry for the inbound folks. There's still be some stuff for you here, but I'm going to focus heavily on outbound, but I'll try to be very balanced when we talk about net new versus rip and replace because it seems like there's a very healthy balance in the audience between both. Yeah, this is going to be cool. So we definitely want to customize the content for you guys today. I see a few of you that are using the Q&A. If you have a question that comes up, if you could put it into the Q&A button there at the bottom of Zoom, if you click, that'll create a queue so that we can get to it. And then uh, other than that, man, let's uh, let's kind of dig in. What's the, can you give us just some quick context into why, um, why isn't psychology taught, I guess, to most people? Why is it something they have to go to a YouTube channel or research paper? Why isn't it taught in sales? And how did you get accustomed to it in sales? And then we'll get to the three sales psychology principles that we're going to get to today. That's a, mil that's a million. That's a probably like a multi-million dollar question, Jason. Like, I wish I, I, wish I could um, give a really simple answer that would just like hit that target and just knock that out. I don't, I don't know why I I've done six different sales trainings, you know, challenger winning by design, uh, Sandler, all these different types. 
And some of them did get into the psychology and very rarely did it get into the level of detail that it needed to, to help me write that next cold email or to ace that next cold call. So um, I, I'm not sure why it's not taught. It's extremely common outside of sales. So if you've ever done a job outside of sales, they teach you something. Like if you go work at like a chain store, they'll like at Chick-fil-A, for example, you ever worked at like a drive through Chick-fil-A, they tell you to say thank you all the time to people, right? Mm -hmm. There's psychology behind that. Like they'll teach you these sort of things to do that help you build rapport, create a good and lasting impression with people that you just don't get for some reason when you get a sales job. I don't know why, yeah. but, but some of this stuff, like I said, it's so ingrained into our brains. It's like hardwired into our DNA that not using it's like criminal. I mean, you're like, literally it's criminal not to use these techniques when they're so effective. And the, and the first one that I think we want to jump into is social bidding, right? As yeah, a starting point. Okay. So let's give some context to everybody. All right. Social bidding is a concept that comes from a guy named Gottman. Gottman is a very famous clinical psychologist back from, I think the seventies. He was the first one to come up with a mathematical model that could tell whether a couple would stay married or divorced. Now, here's yeah. the kicker and what made him famous. This guy could sit with a couple for less than five minutes and with 97% accuracy yeah. decide whether that, that couple was going to stay married or divorced or get divorced. How insane is that? In five minutes, with 97% accuracy, Gottman, search Gottman Institute, it's spelled G-O-T-T-M-A-N. It's famous, world famous. If you ever get married and you need couples therapy, go to, go to the Gottman Institute. Start with that. All right. Read the books. Yeah, it's Read the books. Really, really, yeah. And if it's you're interested really in powerful, that. really yep. powerful marriage counseling, really strong frameworks. One of the concepts that he pioneered was this idea called social bidding. That in an interaction with people around you, you make these bids to the other person to build relationship. It might be something as small as, you know, offering your significant other a cup of water, right? It's a small social gesture. And there's two paths that people take. When, when one person's bidding to another, they either accept or reject, right? You accept the bid. You, oh, thank you for that cup of water. Or you don't say anything and just take it from them and start drinking or put it down. And it's like, oh, that was kind of rude. Like, I just got you a cup of water. You can say thank you, right? And these things dictate the quality of the marriage and the relationship. Well, lo and behold, social bidding applies in any social circumstance, not just marriage. This is how it turns out we build relationships with people that we meet for the first time. It's like when Jason and I met for the first time and we found out we were both married and we have, uh, we're both minorities and we have a lot of common uh, uh, experiences in sales. And, we, and so we started gelling on these topics and now they're part of our core relationship together. You are doing this with your prospects, like it or not. You are, you are trying to build this relationship with your buyer. The social paradigm we're talking about is one of a buyer and a seller, okay? And that social paradigm is one of conflict. You have an agenda that is opposed to the agenda of your buyer, right? You want to yeah. you want to get them to buy the thing. You want to get as much money from them as possible. They might not be interested. They're going to be guarded. So you're in natural opposition. So when you do social bidding, you change the dynamic. You are fundamentally changing the social paradigm from buyer seller to something more favorable, like teacher student or advisor and advisee, or mentor and mentor. There's so many ways you can manipulate the social paradigm. So let me give you uh, some concrete examples of how. This is one, for example, that MJ Hoffman used to teach us literally over a decade ago when I was at Trinet. He used to tell us when you did, we did door-to-door -door sales back then. So we'd literally visit our buyers. He's like, if that buyer offers you to get you a drink, you say yes, no yeah. matter what. I don't care if you just drink a bucket of water, you tell them, yes, please go get me a drink. Why? Because the act of getting a drink for someone is the act of a host and a guest. So you're changing the social paradigm. Tie that into social bidding. You're making a social bid, right? You're making a social build and starting to create the foundations of a relationship. And here's the, here's, here's the kicker guys, as a seller, 
you only have a handful of things that you can make a social bid to your buyer regarding. You don't have this like world of options before you. If you really look at the science and think about what is a fair social bid that a seller can make to a buyer, there's only a handful. And here they are. I've already thought about it for you. You don't need to do this thought experiment. <laughs> One of them is competition. Being upfront and transparent about your competition. Totally taboo, right? We, we don't do that. Wait, sellers don't openly talk about competition. So by doing so, you change the social paradigm because you're making a, a bid, giving them information about your industry, your product, your space that they didn't think you would freely give them. So competition is a big one. Another one's pricing. Pricing is supposed to be hard, right? Pricing is supposed to be a hassle. So when a seller is open and transparent about pricing, they're making a social bid that the buyer completely doesn't expect. A third one is about your product and its flaws. Go to any, I, I guarantee if, if we went to any website of the 255 sellers on this call, any of your guys' marketing website, I wouldn't see a single website that would tell me why your product isn't a fit for me. Who, who your product actually targets and why there's a subset of the market that should not be using your product. But all of you know it. All of you know, as sellers, who should not be buying your product. Why not be open and transparent about that? They don't expect it. Your buyers are not expecting that. Why not unexpectedly delight them and make a social bid by telling them that? And the fourth and final one, so we got competition, we've got pricing, we've got product flaws. The fourth and final one, in my opinion, where you can make legitimate social bidding to your buyer on is implementation, right? Like what does it actually take to use my product? Is it really as simple as the marketing page claims or is it actually kind of complicated? Does it really just work or do you have to put in some effort to make it work? Being really transparent about these four things are 100% social bids. Your buyer is not expecting you to do them, which is great. That means the bar is low. I don't know about you guys, but I'm awesome at jumping over low bars. I'm like world-class. Like if there is an Olympic race of jumping low bars, I'd be in it. So find low bars to jump over. Your, your competition, which is every other seller that messaged your buyer that day, week, month, year, they're not doing this. So I'm automatically you're a step above the rest by making social bids on these four topics. Here, okay. Let me go ahead. You guys get to see my chicken scratch uh, <laughs> from, from Bilal, Bilal here. Um, let's go over some examples. Uh, let's yeah. start with a sales content. I love this, by the way. And um, we had a little bit of a, I don't know if it was, a, we wouldn't call it a debate, but uh, beforehand, there was some confusion on my end around how this fits into an outbound context. And now that you're re-explaining it, I, I have some really good examples. How does this, like with competition, I love yeah. this, this one, because it, it sort of removes the mystery in the buyer's head of you know they're going to talk to two or three other people. They have to, in most cases. Why not make that job easier for them? And it, it's also this display of almost this confidence too, that I don't care if you talk to them because if you're looking for this, they're going to do that better than us. But if you're not, here's what we can do better. How does that come up in a sales call when you talk competition? Where do, where do you bring that up? How do you bring it up? You know, that kind of thing. Yeah, great question. And so uh, let's take it, let's take this from two percent because I like the framework you gave. But Jason before the call was saying, let's talk about it from a prospecting and from a sales perspective. So prospecting being top of funnel, sales being while you're, you know, actively in the sales process of disco and demo and negotiation and so on, and you kind of got them um, in a stage of evaluation. So in prospecting, social bidding typically doesn't work. It typically doesn't work because the medium and the time frame that you're given, whether it's a cold call or a cold email, doesn't allow you to really do social bidding, except for maybe competition. So I've done a I've done a cold call script around competition before for one of the startups that I advise called Stratify. We would call wealth advisors, and we were trying to get them to look at our risk profiling tool. 
there was like a million risk profiling tools already in the marketplace. We we're just one of many. So that was an outbound motion that was rip and replace. What did we do in the first 20 seconds of the cold call? We just be like, we know a lot of wealth advisors use hidden levers, totem and risk allies to try to come up, to try to cobble together risk profiles. What are you using today? And literally the first 20 seconds, we just listed our three main competitors. Yeah. And the response was amazing. Wealth advisors be like, yeah, I actually use risk allies or actually I, I hate hidden, hidden levers. We just, we just canceled our contract like a week ago. That, those would be the responses in the first 20 seconds of the cold call. So immediately people would just respond because we just outed our competition right there. Mm-hmm. We're like, yeah, this is, I, we know, we know what, we know your world. This is what you have to choose from. Yeah. So we're not hiding it. Which one do you use? Or have you not used any of them? And it was, it was instant response, instant response from people. Again, because why would a seller cold call someone and just list their competition in the first 20 seconds? That's not what you do, right? Yeah. You, you, you pitch, you're going to pitch me something about risk profiling, right? No, we're taking a completely alternate approach here. And how did the intro go? And I have a, a way that we do this with objection handling. I think that people will find kind of interesting too, but how does that, how does that intro go again? I want to try to capture that. It, it literally be like this, you know, Hey, hey Jason, I uh, know you're not expecting my call. Do you have a moment of promise to be brief? Yeah, sure. What's this about? I'm, I'm calling from Stratify. I, we speak to wealth advisors all day and a lot of them are cobbling together tools like hidden levers, totem and risk allies to try to create risk profiles for their clients. How are you create? How are you creating risk profiles today? That's yeah. it. Yeah, twenty seconds, and we just outed our three biggest competitors. Yeah, here. Let me and so the responses some- would just be like, you'd be amazed. Like people would just respond. Like some people would just be like, we don't use, we don't like those tools. We don't like risk profiling because those tools don't do them well. Or people would be like, I, I use Riskalyze right now. What makes you ask? Or they'd be like, um, I'm, I, I think there's, you know, and, and you're just in conversation right within 20 seconds because you just, you just did something unexpected that your buyer never saw coming. Yeah. Right? That's, that's the pretty much the only way, in my opinion, though, that you can effectively use social bidding and outbound. In the sales process, Ooh, Let me that's a you. whole other playing field. So I want, I want your take on this because this is something I, I'm pretty sure that this is social bidding. So when you're doing a cold call and let's say you don't use that intro, but someone says, oh, hey, uh, Bilal, we already have a solution for that. We're using X, Y, Z. What I've been coaching people around to respond to that is, you know, uh, someone we're a big fan of is uh, David Primer. He talks about that love, hate kind of thing. So if you do some research and really know your competitors and know what people really like about them and why people choose to go with your competitor versus you, and then what people tend to not like so much about them, you could, when someone says, Hey, we use X, Y, Z competitor. Oh, interesting. Um, what I, what, when people tend to choose, uh, their solution over ours, they usually do it for this reason. And you could start with that. So talk about what they love. Okay. It is a social bit. Yeah, that is a social so, that's oh, awesome. interesting. Yeah, actually, you know, we've competed with them on a lot of deals. I'm very familiar. It's a solid solution. And people usually choose them for this reason when they decide not to go with us. And then you can go on the hate piece. But sometimes what I hear is that it doesn't do this specific thing that people want. What's, what's your guys' experience been? And just get them talking about it. And it has this disarming effect. Because what people aren't expecting to hear from a salesperson is, oh, yeah, people choose your competitors for this reason. And it's actually a better fit for them. Okay. So that is social baiting. So I, yes. I, in an objection handling context in a cold call, if you need something really quick, that's a really good way to get someone to lower their guard a bit. It is. It is totally a great way. That's a, that's actually, I didn't even think of that. I love you brought that up. That's a great example of a social bid because the thing is Gottman talks about social bidding is you giving freely and fairly to the other person, right? Without, without agenda. Like, again, if I give my wife that cup of water, I'm doing it freely and fairly. I'm just saying like, look, you look thirsty and I want to help you. I want to give you something here, right? And the law of reciprocity that is very well documented in psychology says, I am hardwired to respond in kind to that gesture. 
So if a seller on a cold call simply states a fair and free statement about their competition, saying, yes, I know that they're actually very good at this. In fact, better than us in this. That being said, I know that they also can struggle in this area as well. If the buyer recognizes that as a genuine statement, not a biased one with marketing bullshit, but a real statement, they are inclined. They are almost hardwired in their DNA again to respond to that, to show reciprocity and either agree and then expand or disagree and expand. And again, you're using basic psychology. This isn't like some Jedi mind trick. It's just how we are. I think that's what you said there is important too, is it's not used as a way to manipulate the other person or take advantage of them. It's if you're coming really from the place of being a you know strategic advi an advisor for the people that you help, a consultant, I have no problem recommending a competitor to someone if they offer something better because it's different than what I do or what I, I want them to be taken care of. If you're coming from that place, it's going to come out in your tone and you don't have to pretend like you're doing anything. So that, that mindset, I think, is really important to drive this. But I cut you off earlier. What, what are some sales examples where some of this stuff might come up that you uh, find work pretty well? On, on, on discovery. Like that, that, the, your, your discovery call will set the tone for the entire sales cycle. And the things that you can accomplish on the discovery. So let me, let me state this to the group. I have never claimed and never will to be in a, a like, uh, uh, a tactically skilled seller. Like I, I know sellers that pants me, that run circles around me when it comes to like tactical sales skills. For example, I suck at doing onion layering question. You know, this is like a proper sales technique on how to understand why somebody's saying something and get to the root cause of it. I'm awful at that. Okay. Yet that has never stopped me from being an elite seller. Why? Because instead of trying to figure out how to do onion layer questioning, I'm thinking about how I do social bidding in my discovery call to get my buyer to tell me what I want without having to ask them 21 questions, right? Why do I need to be a good questioner? If I just give freely, they give back because of the law of reciprocity. So here's an example. If we're on a disco call, right from the agenda, I'm going to say, you know what, Jason, um, typically the way you would probably imagine this call is going to go is that I'm going to ask you 21 questions, then not tell you about pricing or my competition, and then try to get you to book a demo with me. If you're <laughs> open to it, can we just do something completely different? I'm actually totally fine telling you who my competition is. I won't leave you guessing about pricing for the end of this call. And I'd like to ask you some questions, but they're probably not going to be 21 of them. And odds are, I might actually talk with you about some of the things that you say to me. Is that fine? And right away, we're like minute one and the person's like, what? <laughs> I was yeah. not expecting that. <laughs> right? Like that was not how this is supposed to go. Now I'm going to be smart about it. I'm going to be smart. Like for example, when it comes to pricing, I'm not going to shoot myself in the foot on what could be a big deal that I might learn about in this discovery call. So when I come to tell you about pricing, it might sound something like this. Well, listen, Jason, our pricing starts at 15,000 a year. There's about six factors that go into our pricing. And typically for companies of your size and industry, I see the price usually falling the range of between 30 and 70,000 a year. Now I can go into more details about those six factors that impact that range. Well, let me just pause there and get your initial reaction to the numbers I just stated. So what did I do? I set a floor. I gave myself some pricing guidance that's healthy, 30 to 70. So I got a lot of room to play. And I told you that there's some method behind it that I can explain to you. But I pause for a second and see, are you even, what are your initial thoughts on that? Because if you weren't even willing to pay 15K, we can stop the conversation here. All right. And that's how you talk about pricing. And you're making a social bid by being transparent without hurting yourself and potentially what could be a larger deal. Because again, let's say, and this is the risk, like we get the same FOMO our buyers do sometimes of like, oh, I don't want to say a number because what if this could have been a $120,000 deal? Well, you mentioned that there's six factors. And when you discover their situation 
and how that might impact the six factors. You might tell them, well, you know what? I initially told you 30 to 70, but based on the details you're sharing with me now, I need to adjust that. I think you might be well over six figures, assuming you wanted to go with everything you just described. So you're still, you're not shooting yourself in the foot, but you're still capitalizing on the social bid by being transparent about pricing. And the same thing with competition. So at like full story, for example, I used to use the, the deck that the founder used to raise around where he gave the competitive landscape to the investors in my deck and share that with my buyer. I'd be like, here's the competition. The, the market's broken into three segments, A, B, and C. Here are the top players of each segment. And here's why we think they're great. And here's why we think they're not. And the beauty of it was this. My buyers would look at this and be like, shit, I would never be able to figure this out even if I spent two and a half hours reading G2. This is not something I can find on Google. You know, this isn't something that I can just call up a friend and ask and get these details on. The only person who could share this level of detail about the competitive landscape is somebody who works in the industry. And so I didn't have to ask them if they were looking at a competitor. The number one response after I went over that deck was, well, you know what? We actually looked at so-and-so. Or you know what? I actually have a demo booked with them later, but uh, I didn't realize they were in that part of the market segment, that probably doesn't make sense for me to be speaking with them. People would just respond in kind. And I didn't have to play 21 questions about competition because that social bid was accepted. And then they would come back with valuable detail. Yeah. I love this. What that's making me think of is the way that I sell what I sell, because there's all kinds of different variations of sales training, coaching, on-demand stuff, academies, courses. There's just all kinds of different stuff in there and helping the buyer position what you do better through a simple diagram that shows here are all the different options out here and a graph that simply shows, hey, here's kind of what you get versus the cost the ranges of these and like how much of a lift it's going to be for your team. I like that. You're, you're again, I always, I think of strategic advisor. I don't know how you feel about that term or consultant or whatever, it's you're providing high level 10,000 foot view context. That's, that's what business conversation sounds like. That's what executive C-suite conversations sound like versus getting right into the weeds and getting into a feature battle, which is what most people do. Which most people do. And, and, and to drill it home, I, I mean, I should have probably saved these over the years. I kid you not, Jason, I've gotten thank you notes after my disco calls. Like the buyer sent me a thank you note before I could even send the follow-up email. Just being like, we yeah. really enjoyed the conversation and I appreciate the information you shared. I'm eager to get the documents that you had on the call. Please let yeah. me know, uh, or please email them as soon as you can. Like, that's not normal, right? People shouldn't be thanking you for a discovery call. <laughs> yeah. That's not how it works. But when you give free and fairly and you teach them something they didn't know, and you use social bidding around those four categories, people were like, that we are hardwired to be like, wow, now I want to give back. Like, it's wrong for me to withhold that I've been looking at the competition when this seller is being so transparent and fair about it and teaching me things that I didn't even know. Yep. And now you don't have to be a master questioner, right? You don't have to master onion layer questioning. You'll get the information you want just by the psychology of it. Yes, I love it. Okay, before we get to the other two, Anna has a really good question because I think I might've messed this up yesterday when I was negotiating. <laughs> I think I did come off a bit uh, cocky when I was doing it because I, I said, I actually, I'm not, I don't budge on price is what I told them. And I, and I didn't, I, I think it kind of came from a place of being really cocky, which I didn't mean to do. But her question is, I know it might be all about the tone, but do you have any suggestions on how, not to sound intrusive, cocky, or having the conversation only talking about me and my product. Am I overthinking this? And she put an LOL at the end too. <laughs> yeah. How do you and think about is, that? Uh, I mean, you, 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 you mentioned it from a pricing standpoint, but I, you think she was mentioning it just in general from like her general demos and conversations about her product? Just in, 
Yeah, just in general, when you come forth with all of this information and you're just super transparent, yeah. How do you yeah. how do you think about the the delivery of that, or yeah. do you really think about it? Yeah. It, well, look. It first off, it's really liberating. For, okay, when you guys first do it, it's going to be scary because you were never taught this. And quite frankly, you have some of you all have managers that will will be shocked and potentially like. I've had it happen to me. I've, I've had sales leaders literally tell me, stop talking about competition. Like they couldn't fathom <laughs> that I was doing this and that it was working. The idea that I was openly bringing up my competition scared the hell out of them. I'd imagine you guys have some managers like that too. So just, you know, take this advice and put it contextually in your situation. So that, that's one thing. It's scary when you first do it, but it's so liberating. It's so liberating when you see the face of your buyer, like if you're doing the Zoom call and you see their face and they do this, they like, they'll be kind of distracted and they'll look up like, what? <laughs> like, yeah. this dude just talked about his competition without me having to ask? What the? <laughs> like, it's so powerful to say what your buyer's already thinking preemptively. Yep. Like, hey, I'm going to tell you about price, Jason, before we get off this call today, because I don't want you guessing what this is going to cost. And people go, Thank you. Yeah. Like they're floored. So it's liberating to do. Um, but keep in mind, there's, there's, there is a method, like, a, the, like I said, the pricing thing. Don't just give a number. Give a floor and a range. And then mention there's a set of factors that impact that range. When you talk about competition, talk about the market or segment leader and why you think they're the leader. And don't be afraid then to also say, but here's why I think they don't do so well. Or here's the areas where I see issues, right? It's okay to say that, right? Because then it, 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 it's, it has to be genuine. You're, you do this all day. I mean, who, who, like think of it like this. Whose responsibility is it? The buyer who does this once a year or you who does this every day? Like, so be the expert in that moment and teach them something and, and be genuine about what you're teaching and be informed. Because don't expect them to be. This, this is they'll, they'll buy your thing and then that's it, right? They won't think about it for another year until it's renewal time. You're going to do this three times this day, week, month. So whose responsibility is it to, to bring the best in the conversation? It's you. So be informed. Dude, love it. I want to make sure we have time for the other two. This is, we could talk for two or three hours probably <laughs> about this. So uh, the forgetting curve. What is this? Yeah. Why Oh, how do we it's use the it? the devil it's the devil okay all right so we our brains suck at remembering it's just how we're 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 our biology our brains like we 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 remember everything but our ability to recall what we remember is severely impacted like our mind just kind of does this um like filtering of our memories to make sure that only the most important ones are remembered and everything else isn't so most of the time when you do a demo, when you do a discovery, even when you're prospecting with someone, they're going to forget roughly 80 to 95% of what you told them within about a week. It's just, it's our very nature. The things that they do remember will be emotionally how they felt because emotional memories are much stronger than logical ones. They'll also most likely be remember anything that they thought was unusual in a good or bad way. Like if you had a booger on your nose, they're going to remember you for that, right? If you were really funny or like it turned out you went to the same school they did in high school, mm -hmm. they're going to remember that, right? So something that's unusual will we'll break that forgetting curve. But anything facts and figures wise, anything related to their job, Anything related to logical arguments of ROI, unique value propositions, case studies and testimonials, consider all of that will probably be forgotten within a week. They just don't remember that. Yeah. So your job as a seller is to try to break the forgetting curve by doing these things that are unusual. Now, here's the beauty of it. The reason why we started talking about social bidding first and forgetting curve second is because social bids break the forgetting curve. Talking about your competition early and upfront, that's not expected. They will remember that. How many sellers are they gonna to speak to that week that are gonna do that? 
being transparent about your pricing, super uncommon. That breaks the forgetting curve. Like, oh yeah, that guy who like told me the pricing without me having to even ask. Yeah, I remember him. He's the only seller that did that. So the social bids break the forgetting curve. The other thing that really helps break the forgetting curve is stories. Yeah. Right. Storytelling is much easier to recall. That's why um, if, if anybody's like taken an anthropology course or studied anthropology, there is only one universal common principle between every culture that has ever existed on the planet. And that's storytelling. It's the only common denominator. Language changes, um, everything, like every other aspect of culture is fundamental, food, religion, values, ethics, all of them change. Storytelling is universal. It is a core feature of culture. So your ability to tell a story breaks the forgetting curve. Now, I don't know about you guys. I'm not a very good storyteller, unfortunately. So when I realized that, I was like, oh shit, okay, you know, when they zig, you got to zag, be that you're not, you're not, this isn't, this isn't you, you're not the story guy, okay, you're, I'm, I'm, I'm more of a in, intrinsic person, I'm not the life of the party, I don't tell the funniest jokes, so I'm not going to be that guy that's going to tell like a world-class story, that's why I lean in on social bidding, by just making the experience so unusual that they spend 20 minutes with me and the entire 20 minutes is as if I was reading what they were thinking, bringing up the subjects that they assumed I would not bring up before they even had to ask me for them. That's how I break the forgetting curve. But if you can tell a story and you're good at that and you understand how to create analogies that are provocative and also you know, contextually relevant to the buyer, go for it. You're going to break the forgetting curve by doing so. Yeah. I love what Connor put in the chat. Spoiler. This is a story about telling stories and we we're all listening to me. <laughs> <laughs> do meta. That's do meta. It's hurting my brain. <laughs> you know what I find from an outbound standpoint that people, we, I have some ideas on how you can break the forgetting curve, but I think that people don't take in consideration the forgetting curve. That's the biggest problem with outbound. They send an email to someone one week and then a month later, they'll send another email, assuming that the person remembers what was in that first email. Mm, yeah. They'll yeah, do a do cold call and they'll say, hey, uh, Bilal, like, I sent you that email. And the person's like, uh, what are you talking about? And it puts you in this position where you're immediately on the defensive. But I think that's the biggest thing with Outbound is taking consideration that people are going to forget in probably less than a day. They're probably going to forget your email unless it's really, really good. And they're probably not going to remember your voicemail or anything like that either. Um, so with stories, I want to ask you though, I saw Ethan Parker's on the, on the chat, by the way, um, looks like he's here. Uh, one of the things that he's doing that we worked on that I thought was really interesting is with video Yeah, is telling a story of here's what your competition are. Here's what people like you and some of your competitors are doing to fix this problem. But here's what some of the other folks are doing. That's different that we're helping with. And it's kind of that infomercial, for, we've been talking about uh, David Premier a lot on this too, that infomercial formula. Here's the problem, here's how most people solve it, but here's how some of the unique ways that people haven't heard of are doing it. You know, what are you doing, you know, kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Is that kind of breaking that forgetting curve a little bit when you talk about the novelty and the story, being able to give high level context? Because totally. it, it totally evokes emotion too. It does. If you open up a yeah. video and scrolls through your top three competitors, you're like, okay, I'm paying attention. Like you got me. Yeah. I'm oh yeah. Yeah. Oh, definitely. That that's a hundred percent it. Yeah. That's a hundred percent it. And Hey, shout out to Ethan. Good seeing you, man. Yeah. That, that totally, that totally will, will break the forgetting curve. I mean, you're, you as a seller, you need to be just laser focused on that. Like that's how you lose deals. That's how deals lose momentum is that forgetting curve and that like lack of urgency that happens. In fact, I mean, I'm blunt with people, Jason. I like, I was literally on a call earlier um, last, or sorry, like mid last week with a prospect that asked me to follow up in three weeks. And the first thing out of my mouth was, hey man, uh, so according to science, the forgetting curve says you should have forgotten over 80% of what we talked about. Curious to know, what do you even remember from our conversation three weeks ago? And he started laughing. He's like, I actually remember more than you think. I'm like, can you tell me what you remember? 
And he's like, yeah, I remember <laughs> this, 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 and this I was like, oh shit. You like either you yeah. have a really good memory or I did a really good job. <laughs> yeah. And so he laughed. He's like, no, you did a really good job. It just, I just remembered our conversation because it was, it was distinct. It was different for me. Um, so you, you got to, as a seller, try to break that forgetting curve as much as possible and acknowledge it and just, you know, tell buyers, like, I know it's very easy to forget this stuff. You science tells you, you should have forgotten it. What do you remember? And, and oh, you'll, yeah. you'll, you'll find out where you stand by doing that. What do you, I'm going to throw that into the chat. That simple question. I love that when there's been a bit of time, what do you remember? I love that. It's almost a way because the coach in me comes out a little bit here where it's, it's almost, you're kind of challenging them a little bit where, um, Hey, I don't want to waste time. We spent a lot of time together. What do you remember? Yeah. You know, and you're really, you're putting them on the spot in a really good way. And it's totally okay if they don't remember, but at least you're on the same page because that's kind of when we talked about this at the beginning, even just, um, planning this, what, what I remember, you know, <laughs> what I remember from that conversation was you're kind of in asking, but then also making the assumption that stuff you've already explained, even in the middle of a, a demo call, that's 45 minutes, an hour, whatever, mentioning and bringing up the same stuff multiple times throughout the presentation, if it's important and constantly looping back to what they said was important, because you know what else people don't remember? They don't remember what they say either. So your ability to capture those notes and constantly come back to how your thing can help with that, how it can make that problem go away. That's a big part of it too. Yeah. Yeah. Right, and you're, are you ready for this? I'll give you the kicker. You are, you're dead on. First off, this is why I love doing these things with you because you're right. It is a challenge. I never said that, but you're hundred percent right to label it that it is a total challenge to tell somebody, yeah. what do you remember? People love challenges we love to step up and try to like that's why you know those stupid linkedin posts that are like you know you know it's like rabbit plus cake equals you know birthday and it's like can you figure out the rest of this and it's like a challenge and a puzzle and everybody will try to answer yeah. the question we love that kind of stuff but here's the kicker brain science has proven that we remember things the best after we thought we forgot them okay let me repeat that brain science has proven that the best way to reinforce the memory is to remember something that you almost forgot. So when you ask the buyer, what do you remember? Because you should have forgotten a lot of what we spoke about. You force them to dig back in their memory because now they feel the challenge and they want to prove to you, no, I remember. I didn't forget that shit. And when they do so, they're actually reinforcing the neural synapses to that memory, making it harder to forget forever how crazy is that so it's a double whammy yeah. that makes a lot of sense though that makes a ton of sense and then you're implanting some of these things you know i can think of the other context that this helps really well with and that a lot of sellers don't think about is the story that i the conversation that we have in this sales call today Bilal, is uh you know, 45 minutes, whatever it is, you're going to give whatever version of that that you remember to the rest of your crew that you need to get buy-in from or to that C-level person that you need to get on the next meeting. And when you don't do these memory checks and you ask them, what do you remember? And they don't remember shit. That's the thing that they're going to, like what kind of stuff are they going to make up for the other people that weren't a part of that call that they need to get buy-in from? Totally. One quick thing I'll, I'll share with this, a tactic I've been using that's worked really well is take your normal long demo deck, whatever it is, and put it onto two or three slides and give the uh, person that you're selling to your champion, the highlights. The first page should be here, are the top three priorities that you have that this connected to and what you're trying to accomplish with our solution. And then the second and third ones could be case study or test of whatever they, whatever else they need, but give them that one page slide that ties your thing back into here's what they talked about. And here are all the high level things that our solution, what we talked about can help you with, give them that. So they have the talking points. That's been yeah. a game changer with people uh, in terms of bringing it to folks that I don't get to, I don't get to interact with the VP a lot of the times when I'm selling the VP yeah, of sales. I, totally. That's, that's, I mean, power to, if you could do what Jason just said, cause that's awesome. I love that. I'm lazy. So I, I wish I could do what you're describing, Jason, but I don't, I should, but I don't. 
So instead, oh wait, one of my kids walked in. You want to say hi to you? Say hi to these people. This is my older one. <laughs> this is where everyone's hearts melt. So if you were selling something to us right now, we're like opening the wallets, dude. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's all, it's all good. He's just, I'm, I'm like, I got three kids. So there's like always toys around me and stuff. Anyways, um, but yeah, that, so I'm lazy. I, I wouldn't do that, unfortunately. I should, and I think you should. My, my, my tactic to try to get people to remember and not have to do like the three, the th three slide thing afterwards is I use Google Jamboard. I mean, you've, you've seen me using Jamboard a lot. I, I draw and literally take sticky notes live on the call while sharing the screen of what the thing they're saying is to show them that I'm actively listening. And I will send them that Jamboard filled with those sticky notes and drawings and stuff post the call as our discussion board. But here's what we discuss. And then on the next call, my screen is open with the discussion board. I'm like, okay, so just recapping where we were, here are all the things you told me that I took notes on. Any, anything changed from here? Cool. All right. So then next step should be, and, and that's how I'm reinforcing what they said and showing them that I'm actively listening. I love that, man. Okay. I want to make sure we got time for this last one, because this is a juicy one that you talk about a lot, loss aversion. What is it? Why is it important? How do we use it? Yeah. Uh, okay. So um, this is something a corporate visions teaches a bit. And uh, there's a bunch of, again, psychology about this, about how, how we actually make decisions and the way we, we make decisions, actually it starts in our limbic brain and then the neocortex gets activated afterwards. In fact, this is crazy. A, a university study done at Duke um, like half a decade ago, they rigged up a bunch of wires to people's brain and watched their brain activity. And get this, Jason, I kid you not, the researchers were able to determine that a person made a decision and what decision they made 12 seconds before that person was cognitively aware that they even made a decision. Let me repeat that. These researchers knew somebody made a decision and what they were going to pick 12 freaking seconds before that person was even aware that they've made a conclusive decision on the subject. Yeah, that's crazy. That's how, that's how serious this brain science is. Okay. Because the researchers were tracking what was going on in the limbic brain before the neocortex got activated. Okay. So your buying decision on everything starts here, not here. All right. It's not logic. It's not ROI. It's not unique selling propositions. It's not company values. It's not, um, integrations or features, it's emotion. It's all emotion. And so the fear of loss is the most compelling emotion to get somebody to make a decision to change, mm -hmm. which is what we do, right? As sellers, whatever you're selling, whether it's net new or rip and replace, you're asking the buyer to make a change. <clears throat> so you've got to be really good and compelling to get them to drive consensus and, you know, proceed the commit to the change. It's not easy. And the fear of loss is the biggest driver. So instead of talking about ROI, your discovery, your outreach, even your cold outreach and your prospecting needs to be around opportunity cost, yep. the cost of inaction. David Primer actually, we brought him up. He, he, he uses a powerful phrase called consider the alternative. You know, to tell somebody, consider the alternative. If you don't make this decision, what happens, right? What's going to occur? Like he here's, here's something that people don't generally think about. What does a bad decision cost you? Like a lot of people think about what does a good decision save you? Let's talk about what a bad decision costs you. The time it took you to come up with the decision that's going to end up being wrong. You proceeding down that wrong decision and then realizing it was wrong you turning back and having to undo whatever sunk cost went into the wrong decision. And now you're stuck having to redecide how to get back to the right decision. It's a lot more than you think. Do you really want to risk that? Right? Are you comfortable with the opportunity cost of a wrong decision? Very few people, especially as sellers, challenge their buyer to think that way around the status quo. And some of the most provocative outbound copy that you guys can come up with is not about your product or service, but around the cost of inaction. 
what if you keep doing it the way you have been? What is that going to cost you? And the example you've seen me give before on, on LinkedIn, Jason, is I always come up with this mythical company that's selling some paperless solution, you know, some yeah. digital transformation, whatever. Now, yep. normally you could go and talk about digital transformation and the ROI of paperless and what a huge time saving it is and et cetera. Or you could take this route of opportunity cost, the cost of inaction and tell somebody the sort of messaging that I like to use, which is provocative. You know, we've put 4G on the moon. You can literally buy a car from a vending machine, but you're telling me you got to spend your Friday afternoon dealing with a deadline crunch and a stack of papers this big because somebody else made a mistake. Do you ever get the feeling technology left you behind? That's all about fear of loss. Like, yeah, why is my time getting wasted on this bullshit? <laughs> Versus, oh, look how much time I could be saving if I had a paperless solution, right? Yeah. It's not about saving. It's about what's it going to cost you? You really want to spend your Friday afternoon doing that? Of course not. How many more Friday afternoons are you willing to give up dealing with that problem before you wake up and realize, you know what, there's got to be a better way. Yeah. I love this, man. The example I can share with uh, on the outbound side of things, I love not, I think people abuse talking about competitors. I think they do it in, in a very wrong way. They do it in a way to try to piss people off or to build social proof. And it just, I don't think they quite pull it off. Uh, one of the videos, so this is a company that helps with, you know, like outsourcing, you know, customer support and giving people like much higher response time so that they don't lose customers. Well, one of the videos that we worked on that you can send is you open up, there's this Forrester report that talks about, hey, about, you know, half of people, if they can't find what they're looking for on a website, they'll tab hop to a customer, a competitor's website. And they'll buy a similar product on a competing website. So the video is we pull up that Forrester report. Hey, we weren't, weren't sure if you're aware of this, but I was looking at your top three competitors, A, B, and C. And one thing I noticed that they have on your website that you don't is 24 seven chat. Why is that important? Well, let's go back to the Forrester report. Half the people visiting your website, if they can't find what they're looking for and they need help and no one's there to talk to, they might go to competitor A, B, or C. I'm really curious, what do you guys have in place to avoid making sure that this doesn't happen? And that people don't tab hop to your competitors. You could use that same kind of language in a, uh, a cold call as well. And it immediately puts the person into thinking mode where they're like, oh shit, people are going to our competitors. We don't want them buying similar products there. How are we? It gets them thinking, how, how are we making this happen? And I think that's a really big thing that all of these psychology principles do, whether from an outbound or a sales standpoint, is it gets them to stop and think which I don't think happens much. It doesn't happen much doesn't. these days. It doesn't. And the magic word they use there was avoid, right? Yeah. It, it, that's, that's not a gain word. That's a loss word. How do you avoid? Mm -hmm. And that's a magical word that like you don't find a lot in outbound copy. Yeah. Everyone's talking about what you stand to gain, not what does it cost you? What, what do you stand to lose? What are you avoiding? What's the, what's the issue at the heart of it? And, and to even come up with that messaging, you have to fundamentally understand your buyer. Like you guys did the research to see that all the competition had the 24 seven chat and they didn't. So that's, you know, forget personalization. That's relevancy to the max, right? You don't need to personalize that message and, you know, talk about their dog or their blog or their, you know, you, that, that's a hyper relevant message and it's going to work. It's absolutely going to work. I love that. All right. We're out of time today. There's one thing that we have a huge favor that we'd love to ask you guys. If everyone's cool with it, we'd love for you to take a screenshot of the webinar and then use hashtag death to fluff. We'd love if we could create some noise awareness, especially if you got something valuable from today, take a screenshot of this. We'd love for other people to benefit from this as well and be able to check out the recording. We're definitely going to share the recording, Alberto. If you could take a screenshot and just put death to fluff and uh, as a hashtag and tag uh, Bilal and I, if you want, uh, just wait, what did you learn? What did you take away? We want to get this in the other, in the hands of other sales professionals as well. Yeah, um, yeah we'll definitely write a follow-up and I'll send it out to you guys. Um, 
Bilal, dude, this is freaking awesome. I dropped yeah. your LinkedIn in there. Everyone, if you're not connected with him, make sure you're following him. Uh, what are you up to these days, man? Where can people learn more about you? LinkedIn, is that uh, the best place? Is there anything else you got LinkedIn, going on? I, I've got a newsletter now, death to fluff at yep. uh, substack.com. You can sign up for. And what I'll say to, to Jason's note, if you guys take that screenshot, hashtag death to fluff, if we didn't get to your question, post your question and I'll come in and answer it. I got you. All right. So put your question in, post that on LinkedIn, and I'll come into the comment section of your post and try to answer your question as best as I can. All right. Um, but yeah, you can follow me on LinkedIn and then the newsletter, deathtofluff.substack.com. And let me drop that in as well. You'll get an email from both of us after this. Yeah, take a screenshot of the webinar, Death to Fluff, throw your question in there. I'll be looking for it too. And uh, dude, I appreciate you so much, man. I always learn a ton from talking to you and everyone else. I love the engagement. This is super engaged crowd. So you guys are awesome. Appreciate you, everyone. Have a good rest of your week. We'll see you later. Bye.